the key point is the industry needs certainty, we need stability, we need to know what the go is for the future. The building and construction industry is really good at managing risk, but at the moment, now the ABCC is gone, combined with a raft of these other changes, there's no capacity to control that risk. Welcome to Building Perspective, the Master Builders SA podcast. I'm your host, Will Frogley. Join me as I speak with some characters in the building and construction industry. At Tulux Trade, we're making paint easy for tradies all over Australia. With over 230 stores and over 1,000 paint professionals, expert advice for your next job is closer than you might realise. Need specialist advice for a tricky job? Easy. On site and need it delivered? Easy. So get to know your local Dulux Trade Centre, Inspirations Paint or Paint Spot today. And while you're there, sign up for Dulux Trade Direct for trade pricing and simplified ordering. Because at Dulux Trade, we're making paint easy. Well, despite the odd flare-up over the years, South Australia has generally had a pretty collaborative industrial relations environment, but all of a sudden, uh, everyone in the the state's talking about industrial relations, not only what's going on at a state level, but also at a federal level. So who better to uh, unpack uh, some of the current themes than uh, Sean Schmitke, who's the Master Builders Australia's uh, National Director of Contract Safety and Workplace Relations and also Deputy CEO. Sean, welcome to Building Perspective. G'day, Will. Good to be with you. So like I said, we've seen some very massive changes in the industrial relations landscape over the past probably six months, particularly in South Australia. We can probably just touch on some local themes. I know you've been watching from afar being a, a, a South Australian yourself who's now based um, in the eastern states, but let's just start by talking about what's been going on federally. Can you just – industrial relations, I mean, there's people like yourself who just live and breathe it on a daily basis, but – I guess what I'm after today is for you to explain some of these recent changes in a way that uh, people who aren't checking in every day can understand. So firstly, Sean, can you tell us a bit about what has happened at a federal level recently and just how significant these industrial relations changes are for not only our industry, but the wider economy? Well, yes. uh, uh, And I can't believe that everybody's not checking in uh, on what's happening in the world of industrial relations on a daily basis, Will. But perhaps... Not everybody is exactly the same as me, but um, look, there has been quite a, a significant change to the industrial relations law uh, that got passed by the parliament last year. This was the first piece of industrial relations legislation under the new Albanese government, and clearly it was a piece of legislation which they've introduced, taking advantage of, I suppose, that post-election honeymoon period uh, is still riding quite high in the polls. And they've introduced and passed very quickly uh, some quite fundamental changes to our workplace relations laws. In fact, I would go as far as to say these are the most significant changes uh, in 30 years uh, to the fair work system. And uh, you can forget about work choices. You can better forget about a whole raft of other changes. This is the most significant change. The interesting thing about this change, Will, is that Uh, it's going to be a very slow burn legislative impact. So it's not necessarily going to be some stuff that is noticeable to members straight away. It might only affect them in the next few months or it might not affect them directly, it might affect others. But it is a significant change and I think that once people are affected by these changes, it will become very real very quickly. In terms of what the changes are, there were in fact 26 substantive changes to the Fair Work laws under the most recent bill and the new uh, Secure Jobs Better Pay Act. But I only want to cover a couple of the major areas there. And the first and most obvious one is the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Now, uh, the ABCC, as as the industry will be aware, uh, is something that normally only is relevant to commercial builders, generally larger commercial builders and larger contractors who are undertaking federal government funded work. But the thing about the ABCC and the way that it operated was it made a big difference throughout the culture of the industry in terms of improving uh, workplace practices, ensuring that uh, people in the industry complied with the law at all time and that, you know, when the law was broken, uh, somebody was taking tough action. For the first time in about 25 years, building and construction industry won't have the protection of the ABCC. We won't have industry specific industrial relations laws. And we won't have an industry-specific industrial relations regulator who can tackle the problems that the building construction industry has been renowned for for decades and decades. 
and it's been the first time, as I say, in about 25 years that we've not had the benefit of that protection. And instead, we're just going to be covered by the Fair Work Act and the Fair Work Ombudsman will be the relevant regulator for building construction, just like it is for all other industries and all other workplaces. So that's the first big change. And, and, um, just, and just, what is that? Just, just on that change, Sean, it, it seems like they've got a lot of work to do to catch up and be equipped to uh, deal with our industry because something that really stood out to me is that the, the, the hotline that you can call is only open from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Now, I don't know too many construction sites that only open between those o- operate between those hours. I mean, they've got some obvious teething problems, don't they? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And look, uh, you know, I don't want to um, be disrespectful of Fair Work Ombudsman as an agency. They do good work. Uh, we've got a good relationship with them. The simple facts are, though, that they don't have the power that the ABCC had uh, they don't have the resources that the ABCC had. They don't have the same remit and uh, sort of broad purpose that the ABCC had. And they've got half the tools that the ABCC had in terms of enforcement and compliance. I mean, you know, uh, uh, asking the Fair Work Ombudsman to step into the shoes of the ABCC is sort of like entering a ride on lawnmower uh, in the Bathurst 1000. Um, you're just going to get beaten up straight away. And uh, as much as I know the Fair Work Ombudsman will do their very best, they just simply won't have the, the, the tools at hand that the ABCC had. And, and what that is going to mean is, is, is a couple of interesting things. The first is that the Building Code 2016, which was associated with the ABCC, is also gone. And that means that we're going to see a return back to the old days of very unproductive work practices in enterprise agreements, um, last on, first off, no ticket, no start. You know, you, you have to get the approval. But just just on that, to, just on that, sure. No ticket, no start. That's still illegal, isn't it? Uh, look, it is uh, in in the context of it's a breach of freedom of association laws. But if you look back at the record of the Fair Work Ombudsman in prosecuting uh, people for breaching the uh, freedom of association laws, in particular unions, I think there's only been a handful of cases where they've ever actually actively prosecuted a union. It's the first point. Second point is that the Fair Work Ombudsman won't know that there might be a no ticket, no start situation happening unless somebody tells them. And under the ABCC regime, people covered by the ABCC laws had an obligation. They were required to put their hand up and report this type of stuff and take steps to stop it. Those obligations are gone now. And so it's really a case of will the Fair Work Ombudsman actually be able to know that this is actually happening? The second thing is, will they be able to get the evidence? Uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman isn't going to be like the ABCC and hop in a car and come out to your site pretty quickly. It's going to take them a long time to get there if they do come at all. And who's going to put their hand up to say, yeah, I saw this happening, and then give an affidavit and you know take it all the way to court uh, and, and assist the Fair Work Ombudsman? I think that's going to be very unlikely. So you know that's the real issue here is you're not going to have an effective regulator There's no obligation on the industry to report wrongdoing when it occurs. And then you're actually going to have to put your money where your mouth is if you do report it and go to court and give evidence to say this is what's transpired. Even then, you're going to have to rely on a court to make a decision to say, yes, there has been a breach of freedom of association. So this is going to be the problem with all these changes. We're not going to have that protection of that strong regulator, but there's no one out there effectively making sure people play by the rules of the construction sites. And, you know, if, even if you do put your hand up and there is some sort of action, you've got to take it all the way to a federal court. And unlike the ABCC, the Fair Work Ombudsman is discretionary for them as to whether or not they prosecute someone. So they might not even have to prosecute somebody. So it's those type of practices that I think we're going to see a return of. We are already starting to see a return of them. And it's not good news for building the construction. Sean, uh, Labor were very open about the fact they were going to get rid of the ABCC if they were elected, and uh, the Liberals have been very adamant that you know if they're elected again that they'll reinstate the ABCC. Are we in this just endless cycle now where depending on who wins the election, there's a body there or there's not? I mean, that's not really helpful for anyone, really, that lack of continuity, is it? No, it's not. Uh, and look, the building and construction industry and the ABCC in particular has become a little bit of a political football. I mean, we've now seen three different versions of the ABCC. I can remember when the first ABCC um, got introduced and repealed, and I was there when the most recent version uh, got re-established and, and, and now repealed. Uh, and look, every time the ABCC is restored and repealed, 
I get an extra chin. So let's hope that if it does come back again, it's, you know, give me a couple of years. You're going so, to look but, uh, morbidly obese in a few years, Sean, I think. Yeah. Well, if, if it means returning the ABCC, that's a, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. But at the end of the day, though, it is a very good point. What we're thinking about now and what the industry needs to turn its mind to is a way to um, effectively have a very similar regime to the ABCC, but have it Im- implemented in such a way that it's almost future. Now, there's different ways that we can, we can achieve that. Uh, and I'm, you know, uh, strategically working through all of those options in consultation with the relevant internal master builders committees and speaking to members about the best way that they think we should approach this. But the key point is the industry needs certainty. We need stability. We need to know what the go is for the future. The building and construction industry is really good at managing risk, but at the moment, now the ABCC is gone, combined with the raft of these other changes, there's no capacity to control that risk and it's just going to create big problems for the industry moving forward, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is and we'll, we'll just continue to do what we need to do to, to make sure that the industry has a voice in Canberra and that those decision makers in Parliament, particularly the crossbench in the Senate, uh, know exactly what the problems are and we can give them a solution uh, to fix it. But you're dead right. Uh, we just can't keep going being kicked around like this. We're such an important part of the economy. We're such an important part of job creation. We've got more small businesses in this sector than any other. And the fact that we just get kicked around all the time, is completely inappropriate and it's something we're working to address. The reality is, though, that uh, there is no ABCC for we're not sure how long. Uh, I think from my perspective, it's very important that any one in the industry that is having those kind of challenges does still contact the Fair Work Ombudsman's office because we certainly don't want people to think, oh, look, they're going to be ineffective. They're a toothless tiger. I'm not even going to bother making the call. And then people can say, well, there's no need for a construction specific body because we've received so few complaints. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, look, even if they're not there during the hours the construction site might be working, get on the phone to the quo if you have any of these workplace problems, whether it's a right of entry visit whether it's some type of uh, industrial action, uh, whether you're getting pressure to use a particular subby, not use a subby, if you're a subby that can't get on particular jobs, all of these things technically should be actionable under the current Fair Work laws and you should be in the ear of the Fair Work Ombudsman registering that complaint, registering your concerns. It doesn't matter what size your business is, uh, get on the phones to them. Uh, now, whether they do something immediately and if they're you know, whether or not they're as effective as the ABCC remains to be seen, but certainly creating that evidence and keeping the fact that our industry has lots of unique problems and we have high levels of disputation and we have a union which is not necessarily renowned for being, you know, uh, cuddly and, and all friendly and wants to pop around for a cup of tea and a biscuit on the weekend. All those factors combined are going to change. So we need to keep basically maintaining the rage as much as possible. Absolutely. So the the abolition of the ABC seems to be the the one change that's garnered the most attention. But what else has been uh, happening recently that's uh, important for the industry? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of other areas that have also changed. Uh, Will I think the other big one that's got a lot of attention is the changes to enterprise bargaining laws, and uh, we have now the return of uh, industry wide bargaining or multi enterprise bargaining. And this is, as I said, uh, the biggest change other than the abolition of the ABCC. Now, the thing about the changes to bargaining and the return of industry-wide bargaining is just like everything with construction, there are some slightly different rules for us and it's not as simple as it might be for other sectors. So the easiest way to explain it is this. At the moment, if you want to uh, start a business and employ people, you've got minimum standards under the Fair Work Act. And then on top of that, you have industry minimum standards set by the uh, building construction on-site award. Uh, if you wanted to come up with different terms and conditions from either of those two, then the option you had was to make an enterprise agreement uh, at that individual workplace level. And that's important because uh, having a business that can put in place terms and conditions that suit its specific needs and, and its workers' needs, uh, that's a, a very important capacity. Now, on top of that, we've now got this fourth layer of uh, multi-enterprise bargaining. And what this effectively involves is one enterprise agreement that could apply across the board to multiple businesses and involve multiple different workplaces, including employees 
Now, don't even know each other in completely separate workplaces. You could all be roped in and covered by the one enterprise agreement, which is going to apply to all of those businesses. Could be 10, could be 20, we don't know. And it's going to implement standard terms and conditions for uh, all of those businesses that will be captured by that agreement. Now, uh, as I said, we last saw this in 1983 in Australia when Bob Bork and, uh, and, and Paul Keating got rid of it because they realised it was bad for the economy, bad for productivity and didn't suit a modern global economy like Australia was becoming and has become. So we've got that back now and um, how this plays out is, is, is you know, remains to be seen, but it certainly won't be good. If I look at a construction site, I've been to plenty of sites. Will, I know you have too. The one thing I notice is not every site's the same. The work that's being done is different. The hours of work is different. The different sub is on site. So it's not one size fits all. Now, the good news is, in terms of modern enterprise bargaining and the difference with construction is that certain parts of the sector have been cut out from that multi-enterprise bargaining. Basically, resi, uh, commercial and civil, to the extent that you are covered by the on-site award. So if you use that award, you're basically carved out. But that doesn't carve out the entire sector. We've got joinery, we've got cement, uh, plumbing, fire sprinklers, uh, air conditioning, mechanical contractors, uh, Sparkies, plumbers, those people who all use different awards, they're all subject to multi enterprise bargaining, which means that it may well be that those subcontractors get roped in to one of these broad deals that covers a, a, a large number of employers. And if you're using that, those types of trades on site, there could be ramifications for doing the construction. That's not the only big change, though, in terms of bargaining. We've got some other changes where unions have, have got um, much more or, or greater options now to so raise disputes in the Fair Work Commission during bargaining. Uh, if you can't agree on an enterprise agreement or you get stalled uh, in terms of negotiations for an EBA, Fair Work Commission can now resolve <coughs> that decision or resolve that for you and make a decision. So you don't even have to agree to an enterprise agreement anymore. A third party can just basically make it for you. And there's also <coughs> a range of other changes, including the, the uh, making it easier for unions to initiate targeting, even if uh, the workers say, you know, we don't want to, the union can initiate it regardless. And it's harder to get out of enterprise agreements now. In fact, it's going to be virtually impossible to terminate uh, an existing enterprise agreement once it's been made. Now, those changes, uh, everything except the multi-enterprise bargaining changes, all the other changes to enterprise bargaining apply to building and construction, and they kick in basically as of now. And I think they're going to put it, make a... Uh, you know, a bit of a challenge as we deal with the upcoming bargaining rounds. If you step back and think about it this way, we've got a very, you know, strong union who use patent EBOs in our industry and have done so for a long time. Uh, they've now got a whole raft of new rights to initiate bargaining, to force employers to the table uh, and to stop employers who want to get out of an enterprise bargaining agreement from getting out of it. Uh, we don't have the ABCC anymore to stop unproductive practices on site. Uh, and we don't have the same rules that apply to crack down on unlawful or illegal industrial action or intimidation, coercion. And all of those factors combined means that the industry is going to be in for a little bit of a rough ride, I think, in the next uh, six to 12 months as these changes kick in. And the other thing to think about, mate, is, is you know, building construction, we're not an economic silo. So even if we're not directly affected by multi-enterprise bargaining, everything that comes to a site comes on a truck, transport's captured. Uh, might have been in a warehouse, warehouse logistics is captured, might have come from overseas, the ports are captured, the ships are captured, everything else is captured. So what's bad for the rest of the economy is going to be bad for building and construction. And what's bad for building and construction, as we all know, is generally bad for the economy. So it's not looking good in terms of the future, uh, particularly with respect to, the, to bargaining changes. I mean, these changes are really taking the agreement out of enterprise agreements. It's taking the the focus away from the enterprise, you know, to a more trade or industry-wide or sector-wide sort of approach. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, giving third parties the power to decide what applicable terms and conditions are going to be at your workplace, even if you didn't ask for it, even if you don't want it, even if your workers haven't asked for it. And that's the reality that we're in now. So, as I say, it's, it's not a change that is going to necessarily be noticeable straight away, but I think the industry is going to be affected long term and we're already starting to see that. 
Sean, uh, we know you are a good South Australian. How have you viewed the uh, some of the things that have happened in our industry in the IR front of perhaps the last six months here? There's been some pretty significant changes, haven't there? Well, well, I am a good South Australian, and uh, can I just say that I'm still filthy with the Victorian government for stealing the Grand Prix, uh, what was that, back in 1995. Now they've stolen the uh, South Australian branch of the union as well. Uh, <laughs> what's next? They're going to still run to a wall. I mean, somebody better get out there and make sure that there's no Victorians sort of sizing it up. But look, effectively what, what you've had to put up with there is, is a perfect storm. Not only have you lost the protection of the ABCC as an industry-specific regulator, not only have you lost the sort of capacity to sort of use the previous version of the Fair Work laws to sort of resist some of these changes, all of those have gone. But now you've got the Victorian CFMU uh, coming in and taking over essentially the South Australian branch and obviously flexing its muscles as has been obviously noticeable on the ground. And I mean, whether or not this is as, as a result of the legislation, I don't think it is because it's changed. I think it's just a bit of bad timing, but it's created a really bad, perfect storm for you guys. But I think it's a taste of what we can expect more broadly. And I think that uh, as uh, over the next 12 months, we'll start to see the same type of thing ramping up as we go through various bargaining rounds in other states. And <coughs> you know, Robinson Crusoe as well, Will, I should say, that uh, Western Australia has also been copying it. In fact, there's been a marked increase right around the country in terms of level of union activity. But that's what happens when you get a cashed-up union who had built a reputation on um, you know, a particular approach to industrial relations and workplace negotiations. So it's an unfortunate set of circumstances, but the building and construction industry is very strong. And I'm sure we can deal with it. Probably the only real example where it's spilled into the public domain so far has been with a, a case involving a major subcontractor down here in South Australia, Crane Company. That looked like it could have gotten very ugly. I'm, I'm pleased to, I was very pleased to see that an agreement was reached between the union and that company uh, eventually. The, the media really seized on a part of their agreement where there was a $10 a day performance bonus for essentially rocking up to work on time and not damaging any equipment. Uh, these are the types of things that uh, kind of come into our industry that other people outside our industry just shake their head, don't they? Yeah, 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 no, that's exactly right. And uh, it's, it's often very hard to explain to somebody who's not in doing construction uh, what these type of uh, arrangements look like on a construction site and some of the rigidities and inflexibilities that are, that are built into some of the enterprise agreements we see floating around. Frankly, you know, I'm often amazed that jobs get built on time, uh, sometimes under budget, given all of the industrial strife that we cause and, and all the sort of inflexibilities that exist in these EBAs. You know, I'm surprised anything can get built these days. Let me give you a good example of this, Will, in Canberra there was a bridge or a freeway road extension being built over a major arterial road in between the airport and Parliament House, not far from where our office is. And that particular bridge, every politician uh, who comes to Canberra, you know, for sittings um, will have to get a taxi or a com car underneath that very bridge and through what was a very big construction site. And the union uh, locally in the ACT knew that politicians would be watching what was going on and they didn't want any disruption. So what they did was for that particular agreement that governed that project, they had this, uh, and I think it was uh, called a productivity allowance or something like that, site productivity allowance. And it was something like $100 a day, a very significant amount. And essentially it was just money to buy industrial peace on that project. And it was federal government funded project, so taxpayer was paying. Clients didn't get unhappy. Got done with minimal fuss, um, and as a result, um, we got the, the the job delivered on time. However, that wasn't necessarily uh, would have been the case with other sites. It's just a great example of these type of allowances. And Sean, you touched on the the cost of building blowing out. Have you got an idea of how much the cost of building is likely to blow out in South Australia or Australia as a result of the abolition of the ABCC? We've done lots of research on this point and there's various reports floating around over time. The conservative estimate is you'll probably look at anywhere between a 25 to 30 percent increase in terms of the cost of public infrastructure. And you know, when you think about the amount of money that governments combined are throwing into 
public infrastructure around Australia over the next five or 10 years. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, so all of a sudden that's gone from 100 billion to say 130 billion uh, potentially um, uh, almost overnight. And then of course there's the flow on impacts of all of that to the other parts of the sector and the rates of pay that people get paid and things like that. So there's definitely going to be an increase in terms of costs directly from the abolition of the ABCC. But we're also now seeing a lot of builders anecdotally saying to us that because of all this uncertainty right now, tender has become a real problem. It's not as though you can put in a tender for a $1 billion hospital project or something like that with any degree of reliability at the moment because you don't know what the rate is going to be that you pay. And as any builder will tell you, the cost of a construction or any type of project, half of it's basically your labour costs. And if that's going to go up by, say, 10%, uh, that's going to make a big difference to that job. And the cost of that job, we're talking with the government, in fact, about what processes they put in place to monitor the increase uh, that you know these changes might bring and what uh, additional cost to the taxpayer there might be. But realistically, we are hearing now that builders are basically building in a contingency of fairly significant you know, percentage amount of an overall job cost because uh, they just don't know how much it's going to cost them. And that's the problem with a lot of these EBA changes. They're important in our industry because it helps tendering. That's the only reason why builders use enterprise agreements is it used to give you some certainty for a three or four year period about what rates of pay you'd be paying. But that certainty has gone now. Uh, there's capacity to even undo deals that have been done. So it's really, really going to create some problems moving forward. And the natural response, as I think most members would be thinking, is they're just going to build a bit of fat into a, a tender because they just don't know what, you know, where the cost could blow out at some point in the future. And, you know, overall, that's just not going to be good for, you know, the economy. Uh, and it's certainly not going to be good for our industry. Uh, we need to be operating in a way which is efficient, innovative and effective. We are a modern economy. Uh, building construction is very dynamic. There's lots of very interesting things that happen in our sector. You know, the problem with going back to a system, you know, from the early 80s is that we're no longer in the early 80s. And the world's changed and we, you know, we just don't have the system to match the dynamic economy. So, you know, there's all of these broad issues about stifling productivity and so forth. We're just going to have to see how they play out. And, you know, I, I hope, in fact, that you'll invite me back in a year or two and I can tell you that I was completely wrong. That's my, my hope and that's what we're working for. But at this point in time, it isn't looking good. we just have to see how it plays out. It's a very interesting points there, Sean, and it certainly matches up with a lot of the stuff I'm hearing from members. And don't forget, if the industrial relations is a very uh, challenging area to navigate, uh, it's very complex, but the team at Master Builders is here to help. So anyone that's listening or watching this podcast that needs some help with industrial relations, make sure you give us a call and, and we'll be there to assist. So Sean Schmick here, fantastic to have you on Building Perspective Podcast. I think you covered some very interesting territory and I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks for joining me on Building Perspective. For more information on Master Builders or our guests, please visit our website at mbasa.com.au.